You wearing socks? Whenever I don't wear socks, my, my feet just smell terrible. Well, I'm glad you're wearing socks. <laughs> your raw skin on leather. I never realized how important this show was until yesterday when people were like, oh, so great to see Kevin and David in the flesh. <laughs> Seriously. It was really funny. One, one girl in particular, I don't know what, what she was thinking, honestly. She went up to David and she was like, man, it's so great to see. I was like, we were like fangirling over here to see you and... Uh, you know, you and Kevin finally in person. Well, in fairness, a lot of people listen to it more so than watch it. So, oh, that's a good point. He uh, he is not the uh, the real Stephen Boswell. <laughs> he does have a, a fake Instagram account that looks a lot like you. This is a series, a series for financial advisors. We offer easy to implement marketing and practice management advice. This is the Stephen and Kevin Show. Welcome back, everybody. Episode number 102 of the Stephen and Kevin Show. Uh, today, we are unwinding, debriefing, uh, finding some takeaways from our most recent travels. We've been out on the road a little bit more uh, here recently than we have been in the past couple of years. So uh, I wanted to share with you some perspectives from that, some helpful anecdotes from uh, financial advisors that we've spoken to. Yeah, I was down in Tampa. Stephen was in Boston. We're giving presentations and we're like, oh yeah, there's some, some takeaways here that we could share with our listening audience today. Now, if you haven't already, make sure that you subscribe to the channel, whether you're watching the video version on YouTube or if you're listening via podcast, take a moment, subscribe, give us a review as well. After all that, I can say, for one, this is an interesting time to travel, right? Uh, it, you know, we... Interesting or like pain in the butt time to travel. Uh, it, it can be, right? I mean, my first flight was, hey, you're delayed an hour. Oh, never mind. You're, you're back on schedule. Hey, you're at this gate. No, you're a hundred gates away. Right. Uh, no, you're back now. I mean, you work up a sweat at the airport and that's if you even get out on time. Uh, so yeah, very interesting time to travel. I looked up some stats in advance of this. You know, we are back to pre-pandemic levels in the U.S. for both leisure and business travel. Okay. I mean, all the way back. Wow. Yeah, back to back to those same levels. Uh, but this I thought was interesting. So uh, we talked about some of the challenges, gates moving, flights canceled, and all that fun stuff. I had a flight I had a flight get uh, moved by an hour for an unfortunate stench on the plane. What a weird word to use. That. That's the exact wording, an unfortunate stench. <laughs> an <laughs> unfortunate? <laughs> so here, here's a and, step for you, Kevin. And, and, and if I recall, you were like, well, you know, let's just muscle through that. Yeah, I said, like, well, I'll be tough, you know. Yeah, <laughs> we, we, it's a stench, man. We'll get over that. In April 2022. The DOT received 5,079 complaints about airline service from consumers, mm. up 321% from pre-pandemic levels. Wow. Up 321%. Uh, so, uh, you know, this is interesting too, Kevin. I don't know if you know this. So a lot of this comes from pilot shortages, you know, why they're having to cancel, move flights around and all that. Uh, did you know there's a mandatory retirement age for commercial airline pilots? No, what is the age? I was going to ask you. I would say, oh, gosh, my guess is like 60. 65. 65? And they're okay. trying to push it up to 67. So, oh, wow. Every year, 5,773 pilots are retiring because of that minimum or that maximum. Mm. Well, it makes sense. I mean, like, there's only a certain age you want your pilot to be, right? I mean, no, yeah, no offense but, to someone who's listening who's older, but I'm not trying to get on a flight with a 90 year old pilot. Right? No, but 65 is a little young, I think. Yeah. Anyway, there's legislation underway that might push that to 67. Oh, wow. I learned more this morning about the state of the airline industry than I've uh, I've ever cared to learn. Your 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 points about like shortage in pilots make sense considering that when we were returning yesterday from you know we and we met up in Charlotte you know Tampa and and Boston met in Charlotte to to connect back to Greensboro and as we were landing in Greensboro and I've never had this happen ever the pilot we're you know we're descending the plane's going down and then all of a sudden we're lifting back up and he was like. I guess too high on the approach. So I was like, this is a rookie move. It's right? one of those flights where I wasn't paying attention the whole time, yeah. kind of off in my own world. And then when he makes that move, I'm like playing, paying way more yes. attention, looking out the window. Like, like, has he got it this time? What's happening? Are we landing in a cornfield? Or Maybe the second uh, pilot knows what he's doing. I, you know, and we, we really, I, I don't know a lot about this, but I imagine who's ever in the tower there is like, nope, you're not landing. You're like way too steep on that approach. You're not doing this. And so there is a shortage of pilots. And, uh, we had a rookie on that uh, <laughs> that connection. 
embarrassing. Hey, I'm going to switch mine up a little bit. I had three takeaways, and you have three takeaways, but I'm going with number three first. Okay. Because it's kind of related to this. Uh, my number three takeaway from this trip was that there were will, there will ultimately be a balance between in-person training and virtual learning. It kind of settles out a little bit. I, during the pandemic, it was, well, I would say pre-pandemic, eh, some webinars, not that many. Mm -hmm. During the pandemic, all webinars, as far as how we deliver training and how conferences take place. Now we're getting back to heavy in-person stuff at the expense of webinars. There's not as many webinars happening now as there True. were a year ago. Yep. Uh, and I think at some time that uh, at, at some point that's going to balance out. Like I, I think because of you know experiences like we had over the last couple of days with just crazy flights and cancellations and all that, right. I think we will find a balance again to where virtual learning will play its role for stuff that doesn't require a lot of peer to peer interaction or that is a little bit more technical. Not as I, I think we'll settle into a space to where you'll only do the in person training if it's like a fun venue. Mm, like you're yeah. not going to fly to like. You know, I'm not going to name any names of bad parts of the U.S., <laughs> but you're not going to fly out to some random conference center to go to a conference unless it's built for fun, too. That's like in a room at a hotel. It's kind of like a utilitarian. Yeah. yeah, it's like a, yeah. a an airport hotel specifically yeah. there to learn for a day. I think some of those things we'll just do virtually. I agree. I feel like, yeah, everyone's clamoring to get back right now. And yeah, it, it'll it will absolutely balance out. And right now is we're, we're starting to pick up some more travel. I mean, for us, we realize like, yeah, it is kind of a pain in the butt sometimes to go to these places. Yeah. I like it. Don't get me wrong. But I also, yeah. if I had, if I were given the choice to do, you know, webinars a few times here in the studio and go back to my, my normal life at home. Yep. Yeah. I'd take it all day. Yeah. All day. All right. So my first takeaway, um, from the, the recent travels was during the presentation. So, um, David uh, Lescano and I were presenting to a group of advisors down in Tampa on content marketing. The Steven impersonator. Yeah, he's a Steven impersonator, yeah. yeah. In case you didn't know, um, someone came up and thought he was Steven uh, at one point, which uh, really just filled my heart. You know, it was kind of, it was funny to me. Um, but uh, one of the takeaways we had uh, was stop worrying about giving away too much. So as, as David and I are presenting, we get this question and it comes up like, how much is too much I give away? I'm creating content, but I don't want to give away too much. And we're like, why? Why don't you want to give away too much? Well, then they won't need me anymore. That is that is the wrong mentality. I think that's an old school mentality, in my opinion. It is a, well, look, I mean, here, here's the reality of it. And you know, when you're searching for something online, are you looking for something that is necessarily a paid service? Like you're trying to figure out something, you're, you're gonna find someone else who's gonna give it away for free. So for you right now to build authority, Give it away. And also that DIY investor who you're worried about who's going to do it themselves, they're going to do it themselves anyway. And you just kind of get out of that headspace of I'm going to be giving away too much and they're not going to need me. Well, I think it's also an overestimation of how much people actually watch and remember your content. True. There's a rare few who are just really diving into your content and memorizing it and taking notes on it. Yeah. I mean, we wrestled with this as a company. And I was always on the side of being more stingy. For a yes. long, not anymore, but I was always on the side of being more stingy because we would have people who would, they would print out every article that we ever wrote. They'd make their own binders out of it. They would, you know, they, they would have archives of all of the free training we ever put out and they would use it in some ways as a substitute for us. But that was rare. And that, and that was years ago too. And that was also, we were also paranoid about competitors. Uh, you know, there, people are, yeah, you know, people are sneaky sometimes. They'll take your ideas, they'll repackage it as their own. Um, and so there is some paranoia about it, but I think generally speaking, people consume your content in smaller doses than you would hope. You'd hope that people would just really dive into it, but they consume it in small doses, and it's very hard for you to replace yourself uh, through video or social post. Uh, agreed. And, and I just, I mean, the point that I was trying to hammer home with them was just that, look, it, those who, are, who implement it themselves anyway are probably not going to hire you anyway. Right. Like, you know, that we did research a while back on DIY investors and um, and the likelihood of them hiring a financial advisor. And the only reason was that if they became too ill to do it themselves. Right. So it was like it's very, very rare that 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 occurs. And if you want to stand out online, you're I mean, in this very saturated space, you're going to have to give away some of your best stuff. You're going to have to think about, you know, um, you know just giving, giving more away. Uh, that leads to my next takeaway. And this has been for my last couple of trips. I had a, a, a Seattle trip, uh, as you mentioned, Kevin had a Boston trip. And I would say that in general, my takeaway is that many financial advisors are not just a little behind with digital marketing, they're way behind. Mm. 
And I think in the pandemic, we had less face-to-face -face contact with advisors. Like we weren't out seeing as many people. And for whatever reason, I just felt like the whole industry was making huge shifts towards embracing better social content, improved websites, digital marketing, video, all that stuff. And then you get out and you're talking with people again. Uh, you visit a, a, a random, not random, but you visit a branch office somewhere and you're talking to people about, have you tried this or that? And for the most part, the answer was no. Right. And I, I don't mean to generalize that everybody's in that scenario because obviously there's some very good digital marketers in the financial services uh, space. But there, I mean, I, I would hope that if I ask an audience, how many of you are doing video, that there'd be hands up all over the place of people who have at least dabbled with it, tried it, that sort of thing. If I asked for a handful, uh, raising hands for how many people have tried any kind of digital ads, Facebook, LinkedIn, Google, any of those, I would hope for some hands to go up. Right. Just that people are willing to experiment with some things. And uh, I, would stay, I would say still, compared to the average small business out there, that many financial uh, advisors are, are significantly behind and could benefit from exper experimenting. If you're a financial advisor who has a robust digital presence, I'm willing to bet something. I'm willing to bet that you have a multitude of service providers. Yeah, most people have freelancers and contractors that they're using to pull all these services together when you could have one entity here at Oxley. We do the web design, the social content, digital advertising and videography, newsletters and podcasts. We've got a suite of services built for you. So you're saying, I mean, and we know historically financial services industry has always lagged when it comes to adoption, right? I mean, there's a lot of compliance hurdles and all that yeah, stuff. Yeah, there are but reasons. You're, but you're saying you think you thought that it would be more ahead of the curve after the pandemic than than it is, right? I now. do. And, and part of the reason is that we know firsthand from having worked with so many of the firms out there that things are, are more allowed now than they were two years ago. They are. And you hear so many people out there saying, well, I had a guy ask me yesterday, uh, what about compliance with doing video? And ask him the firm he's with. And he tells me, and I'm like, bud, you can do video. Right. Like, we worked with people at your firm. Yeah. Like, it, I, I feel like people have used that as a crutch for so long that they don't realize always what's possible in their firm and they don't experiment. And on, on the other side of that, you have advisors at some of those firms that even, you know, they, they may allow, let's say, video, um, but there's a 27-point step checklist process to, to submit a video but they still do it, right? And they get through yeah. it because they want to be the first mover in their industry and they want to reap some of those rewards. And that's the extreme too. Most people are pretty permissive right now in terms of what you can put out in terms of social content and, and video. Most mm -hmm. firms are. And, and I, I think the, the the case for it, and I get it for, for a lot of you out there who have a variety of priorities, right? You're servicing clients, you're managing money, you're, you're still, and rightly so, using a lot of traditional marketing methods. All that's good, I get it. But I, but I would like to see more of an investment in the future which is what I think digital marketing really is. Mm -hmm. um, and I think sometimes people are unwilling to put in the energy and money to make that happen. Like, for example, if you go to interview the top 10 at any major firm, you can bet that that top 10 did, did not get there uh, by digital marketing. Right. They didn't. So I think sometimes it's easy for you to look at it and say, well, I mean, the biggest producers here didn't get there by digital marketing. And you think, well, you know, I need to model exactly what they're doing. Well, yeah, but they they built their business in a different time. Exactly. So they're somewhat dismissive of it. Yeah. So I think when you, and even if they embrace it now, they didn't build it that way. And I think sometimes people, you know, marginalize social media and, and digital marketing because it's not what is exactly putting up hundreds. Like if you were to interview somebody now who's bringing in $150 million or $250 million in new assets a year, it's often not because of social media. True. Right. I mean, it's not that we're not seeing successes with right. it, but it's not that level. And I think what we're looking at in our expectation is most people's is, is that as the years go on and the more digital consumer who's younger now and doesn't have as much money, as they get older and acquire more money through inheritance, through work, through whatever, you know, th th this is going to be putting more and more points on the board. Yes. So anyway, I, that's a, I don't want to say a pet peeve of mine, but I would I would encourage everybody out there, if you haven't been experimenting lately with some of what is, quote unquote, cutting edge in marketing, do it. I like it. Yeah. And OK, that, that kind of leads into the next, um, you know, the takeaway for me. Right. And and to your point, when we, when we were out presenting it in Tampa, this is a, a newer group of advisors. Right. And um, and, and I remember saying to them at one point, I said, you're going to think yourself like two or three years from now, if you start creating this evergreen you know, um, you know, cornerstone type content that you have it, right? And that's, it's living somewhere. Maybe it's on, on YouTube and it's searchable or it's on your website, but you're building that authority. Now, my takeaway is a little, is a little different. Now, this being a newer group of advisors, 
we we did some brainstorming with them around series that they could create when it comes to content. And a lot of them had these this idea for series that were more kind of 101 like series, like understanding, I don't know, what is what is an ETF? What does that mean? And like and 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 look, because they're learning a lot of that stuff. And one of the takeaways for me is that if you want to learn more about any topic or become an expert on a topic, create content on that topic. Like, like for us, when we think about, let's say we want to dive deeper into Google advertising, we, we write an article on it. We do research, we read, we watch videos, we learn about it, we create an article on it, and it really helps clarify your thoughts. So, and, and as we were talking to them, we we're saying, look, yes, you're going to create content out of it, but also you're going to really get clear on when you're communicating with a prospect, you're talking to a client, like you know that topic better and you have a, a really good sequential flow of how you explain that topic. So if you want to get better or learn about any topic, create content around that topic. I like that, Kevin, because I think when you're, when you're thinking about your natural topic list, mm -hmm. you think about things that you already know. Yes. Like what could I share on video that I'm already really comfortable in talking about? As opposed to sometimes saying, I'm going to stretch myself. Well, what should I know more about is this and that. And yeah. Sorry, could you hear that in your ear when I bumped this? A little bit. I, yeah. I noticed you perk up like. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I wasn't sure what that noise was. Um, <laughs> but, you know, it, it, uh, I agree with that logic, though. Like every, you know, every third video, put out one or every third article you write, do it on something you don't know that much about. Yeah, that you, but you should know more about, right? And then it forces yourself to do the research, clarify your thoughts, um, and then, you know, maybe you start with some sort of article outline and then you move to video and, and so forth. Good. Uh, my third takeaway was based on the audience that I had for this last engagement. Yep. Very international. Yeah. Like very, very international. Yeah, what, what, not, was, what was the percentage of like U.S.-based participants versus everyone else? I would say else? maybe at best 15% U.S.-based. Okay. That's an anomaly for us, yeah. right? Oh, I mean, yeah. we do a lot of work in the U.S. and Canada. I mean, I would say 20% of our, our clientele is in Canada. But uh, outside of that, like yeah. these were from all of Singapore, parts of Africa, Australia. It's cool. Yeah, it was cool. It was so interesting. Yeah. Uh, but you know what my takeaway was, though, is that we all face similar challenges. Marketing works pretty well across borders. Yeah. And I would say that I generally come away from those things thinking that the U.S. and Canada are a little bit further ahead than some other nations in terms of marketing techniques. That's my, I mean, no offense to any of them, right. but I think that we are generally further ahead in those spaces. Mm -hmm. We spend, I mean, as an industry, we spend a ton of money on training and developing new ideas for growth. Sure. We're at the epicenter of social media here in the U.S. I mean, that uh, we are, we are fairly advanced. Um, but I think that people are working towards similar things. They're, you know, they're working on hosting client events. They want to be influencers or thought leaders on social media. Um, and that the best of them you know, coming from different countries are not that dissimilar to advisors who are the best of the bunch here mm -hmm. in terms of they're the ones who have the best personal skills, the ones you want to talk to the most. They're friendly, they're assertive, they work hard. I mean, there's a lot of commonality there. So did you get similar questions? I mean, like, so, so you know, you're yeah. presenting to this audience, are you getting questions that are, gosh, that's a question that I get a lot of times from US, US based advisors, right? Well, yeah, I, I think people, you know, and I'll give you a, a, a two examples on this. So one question was around how to get better at uh, becoming a thought leader on Facebook. One participant wanted to know, you know, how she could you know, grow an audience on Facebook. Okay. And that's a question that we get around here a lot. Uh, another uh, participant uh, had a question, and this, this is why I say sometimes that I feel like we're a little bit more advanced than some of them. His question was more around direct mail. And I, I don't know that many financial advisors now around here who are still doing that. I'm sure some are. Sure. But most are not. Um, and I, you know, in a nice way, help try to redirect him towards some things that are going to give him better bang for his buck, going to help him reach his target market more, uh, you know, more uh, effectively. But yeah, the questions are really similar. Yeah. I just find people, and it's also, uh, you know, people are eager right now. They want to learn about marketing. They want to build new, new clients uh, or grow, you know, grow their business. But they, but they face the same mm -hmm. challenges. And, you know, and even when we were doing some work with the that Indian bank, right? And we we're doing some presentations there. I remember I was nervous about what the Q and A would be like. And it was like, Hey, if I have a friend who I want to approach about business, I'm like, man, we talk about this stuff all the time yeah. in the U S. What do you say when you want to close somebody, you know, for you know, the right. next meeting, how right. do you get that? It's like language is universal. Yes, exactly. There might be some cultural differences. There right? are. Yeah. yeah, for sure. But, uh, but overall, yeah, same strategies. Yeah. That's interesting. Cool. Uh, and you also took some selfies while you were there too. Hey, right. You know, I, I felt like a mini celebrity. <laughs> oh, Mr. Stephen Boswell, can I get a selfie with you? They're floating out there somewhere. 
on someone's Facebook page. Yeah, my wife said, well, you should have gotten a selfie too. You should have taken a picture, you know? That's what we said. We were like, hey, do you get any pictures for social? Nope, but you took some selfies with other people. So anyway, well, uh, sorry. They knew the real Stephen Boswell, is that why? Yeah, they noticed you were the real deal there. Anyway, all right. My, uh, my next takeaway here is the, the statement here that I, that I have is that video creates the illusion of someone thinking that they know you. That's the best way I can say that. It creates this illusion of closeness and, yeah, thinking that someone knows you. So, so as David and I were presenting, we, we talked about video. We're talking about video setups and all this kind of stuff. And one participant, she kind of raises her hand in the front. And she said, I just want to say, I feel like I know you. I've watched your shows for five plus years. And I was just so excited that you were here and that I feel like I know you. I feel good. Yeah, Steven's patting himself on the back. If you can't hear that via podcast. Now, my point was, and it was actually perfect timing because we're talking about the power of video and just how important that is. I mean, I said, hey, by the way, Christy here, like, she doesn't know me. Like, and, and she doesn't know me at all. Well, but, she kind of does know. You just don't know her yet uh, But until but she, that point. But she, she kind of knew you. She thinks she knows me. I mean, and, but it, it creates that, like, gosh, I feel like I know that person. And and it, that's, what, that's what's so powerful about the medium. Uh, and, and also, like, when people come in, like, you have a prospect coming in who's watched or consumed your videos changes the that it, dynamic of that whole sales process. It's like they come in, they understand your philosophy, they understand what you stand for, what you believe in, um, you know, if they trust you probably already. I think, I think that's think a huge trust one. Built. I yep. think that's a huge one, the trust factor there. Yes. Yeah. Think about it from a, think about it from, a, if you listen to podcasts, obviously, but also if you uh, listen to the radio on the way into to work in the morning and you've got a certain radio station, the personality's there, do you feel like after a little while listening to them that you know them? Yes. Yeah, for sure. Um, they don't know you, but you know them a little better. Yeah, or at least you think you do. Yeah, but also, you know, if, if it were, you know, sticking with the financial advisory space here, if you were listening to someone's podcast for a while and it came time to decide if you would, would use them or not, you would have a pretty good sense of how smart they are, like how uh, really into their craft or not they are. That's true. You'd have a sense of whether or not they seem trustworthy. By, gen I mean, genuine, yeah. Yeah, I mean, you record enough podcasts, you record enough videos, people get a sense of you. I mean, it's yeah. hard to hide you after 100 episodes. Yeah. Well, I, I didn't share that takeaway again to, to try and be like, you know, pat on the back. But it was just, it was cool. It's, it's, it's affirmation that you're doing yeah. the right things. And for those advisors that were there, we're saying like, you can absolutely do this. Like, there's nothing stopping you from doing this at all. But, you know, it, it kind of goes back to what we were talking about, you know, some of the stuff being a longer term play, investing in the future. Yeah. That's a, that's a pretty good example. Yes. I mean, that, that her recognition of you and her relationship with you there came after years of watching. Right. You didn't put out one video. No. She's, <laughs> she's watched videos for like five years. Yeah. And then, yes, we're there in person and she's like, oh, there's Kevin and there's the Stephen imposter. And like, and she's just, <laughs> she was excited. So. I, you think this is a bad thing? I kind of like having a Stephen imposter. I, I need uh <laughs> I, I need more, uh, oh, you know, I, I could use that. I love it. I could be in mul multiple places at one time. <laughs> but, you know, gang, for, for a lot of what we're talking about here, there's no one perfect way to market your business. There are a million options. I mean, you look at the list of viable marketing strategies. We talk down about things like cold calling and direct mail and some things like that. But the list of actual viable marketing solutions is not shrinking. It's growing. Sure. There's a lot of stuff that works. And some of that comes down to leveraging other people. Leverage us. I mean, we have uh, on staff now, we've got uh, close to 50 people. Yep. And they have a variety of expertise. Uh, expertises? Expertise? Uh, I think it's just expertise, man. I can't even speak about expertise <laughs> if I don't know how. Uh, Expertises. Expertises. Uh, but yeah, I mean, this is kind of why we're here. If you want to get into video, we have people to steer you down the right path there. We probably worked with your firm. We know how compliance works. The same with podcasting and newsletters and websites and social content and digital advertising. And with generally growing your business and wanting advice, we have coaches who have a wealth of experience. So lean on people like us. I mean, there's, there's absolutely no reason. It's like another takeaway from conferences is that, you know, the reason people go to those things is to broaden their own horizons. People take a ton of notes. They talk to the presenters, they talk to each other, and you come back with a whole different perspective on what you should be doing. Mm -hmm. You wake up and you go into a fairly isolated environment every day. You wake up and you go into work and there's one or two of you there. 
it, it's easy to fall into the same habits over and over and over again. Oh, yeah. But when you lean on other people who actually, you know, they, they've got a great deal of, uh, of expertise or expertises, um, <laughs> you know, you're going to grow more quickly than people who are more insulated. Yeah. And, and even, you know, and again, like a little bit of a plug for us, but, you know, at, at Oxley, yeah, we have a lot of those you know, services. Also, there's some accountability when you join a service, right? It's like, I need to get this done, right? I, I am paying for this. I need to do it. And I think if I had to give one final takeaway, it would be that consistency can make or break you. And there was another participant at our event who raised her hand and said, gosh, it's interesting you guys are talking about Cornerstone content and Cornerstone series. I started one two months ago and I stopped. We're like, well, why'd you stop? I don't know. I just stopped. It's like, no, like you, you, gotta, you have to stick with it. And it's just, it's just like anything else in life or the consistency is going to pay off in the long run. Yeah. With that, again, like, comment, subscribe. Glad to have you as a listener. Thanks for, uh, for joining us.